Welcome to Le Welcome to Lester Fan TV. Are you ready for the show? Thanks to our sponsors, ADT Taxis, Everards, Pucka Pies, Pink Car Leasing, Lester Riders, Hologram, The Fox's Arms, Peter's Pizzeria, Hope Against Cancer, and Newbie and Co Estate Agents. We want your views, we want your comments, so join us live. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good evening, welcome to Leicester Fan TV. Tom here, standing in for Phil tonight. Uh, he's having a night off. He's a busy, busy boy, and I think someone's getting a special birthday present tonight after we were talking in the chat earlier. Joined tonight by uh, Simon and Mark from It's Eleven, It's Heaven, It's Jamie Vardy podcast. Let's get them in. There's so much talk tonight about, especially after the weekend's defeat. Good evening, Mark. Hi, mate. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Thanks, mate. And Simon, how are you doing, lads? Good evening, Tom. Let's How get some right? comments in. Yeah, good. Thanks, mate. Thank you for coming on, as always. Let's get some hellos. Good evening, councillor. How are we doing, sir? I'm going to put this up here now, because for anyone said, put the light on. Right. Technical issue that my downstairs light decided that they didn't want to work about an hour and a half ago, and every time I go to the fuse board to turn them back on again, they fuse straight out. So I'm stuck with socket power and a tiny table lamp. It wasn't the ideal situation for tonight. Romantic. Uh, oh, exactly. <laughs> Good evening, Neil. Hope you're all uh, right, mate. Good evening, everyone. Right, let's go cut to the chase, boys. Where do we start? Mark, what's your uh, assessment after that uh, embarrassing, in my view, another embarrassing defeat to Chelsea at the weekend? Where to start? So, I think first and foremost... You can't go into a game against a side like Chelsea at the minute expecting to lose because all of our competitors down the bottom, they're picking points up against the, the sides that are up there, aren't they? Look at Bournemouth at the weekend beating Liverpool. And I felt that Chelsea were, were there to be to be got out. I didn't think they were great defensively. I thought we were going to have some chances, but we've got to defend a lot better. And we're lucky, really, we didn't let five or six in. There was a couple of close offside calls and they hit the post as well. Uh, disappointing performance, disappointing result. And it puts us right back in trouble at the moment. Exactly. I mean, so let's just let's go through the game. I mean, let's let's talk about the first goal. I mean, it, it only had to fall to one man at the back post. What was your opinion of Danny Ward's positioning and how does Ben Chilwell get a right-footed volley into the bottom court? Well, the near post from that angle. Um, clearly in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, I was sat down in that corner actually this week. So I was one of uh, quite a few that were giving Chilwa a little bit of tap when he was going to take the corner. And uh, he was very quick to uh, to come back and uh, show us what he thought after he slipped, slipped that one in on the near post. Yeah, bad positioning from from uh, Ward. I think, I think to be fair, a couple of times, second half, um, Ward kept us in the game. He pulled out some good saves. But yeah, uh, you would expect a keeper... Uh, in the Premier League to not not get caught at his near post. So, yeah, that's not a good start for us. Um, but it's an all-too-familiar uh, pattern of late that we we want to go behind before we start to, to do anything about trying to win a game. Obviously, then Chelsea had a goal disallowed for VAR. Thank God for that. It could have been 2-0 before we knew it. Let's then get the equaliser through Patterson Daka. Brilliant strike. And to the fan who ran down four or five steps behind me to tap me on the shoulder and say... That's because of Brendan Rodgers' tactics. He soon was very quiet after the third or fourth goal went in at the other end. Let's put it that way. Uh, obviously, Praxis and Daka scores. He, he gets a bit of a break. Chelsea were a bit sloppy at the back. And Daka with a fine strike. So pleased he finally got another goal. It's taken a long time since his last one. Obviously, then we go behind again. And some ways, I, I was talking about this in the ground. And if you look at the build-up to that goal, it all comes from Pats and Daka losing the ball high up the pitch. He had the opportunity to run at their defence and for some reason he stopped and he loses the ball in a position where he doesn't need to. He could be running towards their goal, but he, he just does not seem to have the confidence to run it anyone at the moment. 
Before we know it, our back line is flat-footed. Jusber Hall, Mendy, I have to call them two out. Don't close the ball down. And don't get wrong, it's a, a world-class ball to flick over the top and it's a world-class finish. And Danny Ward's in no man's land. In some ways, you want him to come out and flatter their striker in my head. I'm thinking, even if you give a penalty away, you leave, at least you've come out and done something in that position. What did you, did you make of that second goal, Mark? Because it was at the point of just before half time. It was a point where the game was on a knife edge and we just seemed to, like, lost lost the plot. Disappointing, wasn't it? Because it looked like if we went into half time at 1-1, that we might sort of come out on in the second half with a real sort of point to prove. But in terms of the goal itself, there, were, there was lots of mistakes in there. You've already said about the, the runners not tracking uh, in Havertz as he, as he walks through. I think it went over Suter's head as well. And Danny Ward, for me, he started to come. So he started to look like he was going to do what you... Everyone was expecting him to come and either claim the ball or get close to it and potentially flatten Havertz. And, you know, if that had been it, then so be it. But what you can't do is stand on the edge of your six-yard line there and let the ball go over your head. I mean, there's a classic photo in doing the rounds now, isn't there, of him just watching the ball go over his head <laughs> helplessly. Uh, and it was, a, it was a real blow to us that right at half-time. Very disappointing. I was saying, come out second half. I give just before half time. I have to mention one player who sort of turned the game for me. Even though we weren't playing too bad, it was still we, we weren't making challenges. And Mendy with two smashing tackles on the halfway line in the space of 10, 20 seconds really seemed to pump Leicester, and we seemed to have a go just before half time. Second half came out, and it felt it was Leicester on the front foot. Leicester the one taking the game to Chelsea, although Chelsea could do on the counter and. The two opportunities, one by Jewsby Hall and the other one cleared off the line from Harry Suter. doesn't really know much about it. He's just directed to goal. The Jewsby Hall tra- chance, I mean, Simon, I mean, what what can you say to that? That is a player who seems to me at the moment very low on confidence, does all the dirty work well and can win the ball back, but can't pass the ball five yards and can't finish off a goal when it's literally open. Yeah. I mean, I don't think anyone could ever question Jewsby Hall's effort in a match. Uh, he puts everything on the pitch, leaves it all out there. Um, like many in our team at the minute, he seems to have been drained of confidence, um, seems to be stretching around to try and fail, find himself some form. But yeah, all he's got to do is put his foot through that. It comes across the box. All he's got to do is strike it. It's in the back of the net and he, and he, and he fluffs it. And I think his own reaction after the miss said it all. He had his head, head in his hands and he knew it was a pivotal moment in the game. And I, I think it probably was, Tom, that had that gone in, I think the rest of the game doesn't play out the way it is. But it was a game for me of momentum in that, you know, when that VAR goal was disallowed for Chelsea, it felt like we got on the ascendancy for a while. And we were really on the front foot and we had Chelsea pinned back in for a while. Albeit, I, I, you know, I get frustrated, like I'm sure you all do, with, with the constant passing to the back four all the time when we oh, get into attacking positions. It drives me crackers. But, yeah, well, it, it, that was a pivotal moment again for me, the, the juice be all uh, miss because it seemed to swing the game back in Chelsea's favour. Of Chelsea get the third goal. And then a lot of people are putting this in comments and I bring it up because it was my biggest thing at the weekend and I put it straight on Twitter at the time was Pepe Mendy. Magic Mendy was having probably the best game out of anyone on the park, probably up there with Madison who was trying to create things. And Rogers felt the time was to take him off and bring on Simari. Now, it's nothing against Simari, but I still think at the moment in time and Diddy and Simari are miles away from the way Mendy has been playing. I think what we saw that at, at against Tottenham at home, he had a very good game against them. And I think he had an even better game yesterday in some way with the team not performing well. His passing is probably better than Samari. What did you make of that sub, mate? Because I think the groans, the shouts and the crowd, well, there weren't really much clapping going on to Mendy going off. It was more anger towards Rogers, Mark. It, it, it was disbelief, wasn't it? I mean, I, I said to my mate that I go with, I said, I cannot believe that I made the substitution. I'm only thinking for it is... Maybe Mendy was showing too much grit and determination and positivity uh, and it didn't quite fit with Brendan Rodgers' game plan at that stage because uh, he was the best player. He was our best player again. He doesn't lose the ball. He wins the ball back. He he, he was positive when he got hold of it and he was he flew into a couple of tackles just on half-time like, like we spoke about. What I don't understand is why, why Samare fit for him? So even if he's coming off, surely that's going to be to do with a change of shape or an injury or something. It doesn't look like that was the case, but but why Samare? Samare came on and gives the ball away, sloppy passing, too slow. His tempo is not right. It, it just it took any momentum that we had away from us at that stage, and that was the point. Really, like we looked like we weren't going to get back into it. Obviously, Chelsea killed the game off. It's done and dusted. While Faz then flies into another tackle, 
it reminds me very much of how Sainte was in his first season. Very, I've got to go win the ball every single time. I'm going to go through the man every single time. And if I win the ball, great. If I lose it, I'm going to get booked. And somehow he's going to get that away from his game. Has he not, Simon? Yeah, he, I, f- I think we've all been, by and large, impressed with us and the way he's played since he came to the club. He does consistently in games get booked. Um, I think he at one point had four or five bookings game after game. And it is just that kind of rush of blood to the head when he's he's like all or nothing type of player. And it can be great for your side in terms of motivation and passion and gets the fans going when when a player like that is, is passionate and gets stuck in. But unfortunately, when you're playing at the very highest level as we are in the Premier League, it, it only takes a slight miss time and, and you're off. And and, he, he, and I absolutely agree with you, Tom. He's, he's got to work with the coaching staff and, and look at the way he makes decisions in his defence, his defensive uh, work because he is just too rash at times. And again, it's another headache that we could have well done without um, coming into a, a group of games where we need to start picking up points and rapidly. Obviously, then the game's gone, Faz is gone, and we go into injury time. And then for some strange reason, I still can't understand it. Rogers thinks the best plan is to bring on Johnny Owens for two and a half, three minutes at the final throw of the dice and bring off your most creative player in James Madison. Mark, you try and tell me why that was the best idea for the club. Because at me, 3-1 down, you might as well lose 4 5 6 nil for 6-1. Then and, and, and hope that you might get a breakaway goal with Vardy on the pitch and Tete and have that creativity. Then bring another defender on base. You just say, I give him now, lads. Hands up. Yeah. Well, the, the white flag's raised. That's exactly what it was, Tom. The, the white flag was raised and it was damage limitation at that point for as far as Brendan was concerned. Um, Madison obviously picked up a knock, quite a heavy uh, knock to his ankle. But instead of bringing on a, an attacking player in Dennis Pratt for him, he's decided that uh, to, to compensate for the loss of fast, that we're going to bring Johnny Evans on as, as well for the last couple of minutes. So, you know, in our position where we should be fighting and scrapping in every second of every game, to give up on a game before the end, especially with seven minutes injury time that came with it, is criminal. You know, back in the O'Neill days, you wouldn't have ever dreamt of anything like that. I mean, because you'd have gone three one down in injury time and scored a couple of goals and made it three all, thinking of the Arsenal game and in particular mm. back in the day. But yeah, we, we, we just gave up on it. And that is in sort of a, a clear indicament of where we're at at the moment as, as far as Brendan Rogers and Leicester City is. A couple of indi- play, you know, individual players, and we'll obviously we'll talk about now. One was a, I'd heard it the night before and sort of got the hint in this was going to happen, but this man here, Daniel Amate. I mean, the warning signs had to be on the cards for me after what happened against Blackburn when he played and gave the ball away for the first goal for Blackburn. He didn't really sell himself in glory at the weekend, in my view. A lot of wayward passes, a lot of missed position where he needed to be on the ball. What did you make of Rogers' tactics to go with a back... Well, we'll call it a back five, because basically that's what it was against Chelsea, Mark, uh, Sam, Simon. Um... It didn't surprise me. And the reason it didn't surprise me is because I think he was almost forced into that decision by circumstances. Um, I don't think Barnes was 100% fit for the game on on Saturday and, and, and made the bench, probably declared fit, but not fully match fit, fact, match fit, hadn't trained a lot. Tete has quite clearly had one good game and then has faded into the background since that first game against Aston Villa. So we're not exactly flush. Especially, especially given the fact that, that he let uh, Albrighton and Perez go in the transfer window as well. We're not exactly flush of attacking wide players. So given the fact that Barnes weren't completely fit, I think it was a 50-50 decision. I think it was half tactical and half circumstance. Um, I, don't think, I don't think it was particularly a bad decision. Um, I don't agree with him playing Armity as one of the back three. I'm with you, Tom. I think he's lacked form lately. He looks like uh, he, he always has at least one or two potentially fatal mistakes in him every game lately. And I personally, I'd have much rather seen Siuncu drop into the back three um, with the other two lads if he was going to go that way. Um, yeah, not not for me, Armity, at the minute. He looks miles out of form. Mark, what was your overall feeling when you, you arrived at the ground? You'd seen the team, you'd seen Amati, you'd seen he'd gone to a back five, he'd, he'd scrapped the whole thing that had... Strange system that had worked against Tottenham, it had worked against Villa, the whole wing back to wood wing is back in play, in natural drop and deep and linking the play up. What did you think when you does it feel like once again we're going defensive before we start the game? 
I wouldn't even mind us going defensive at the minute because if we were going defensive, that means we'd keep some goals out. And, uh, <coughs> as I tweeted earlier, we've conceded 46 goals this season. That's the third highest amount in the, the division. So when I saw us with three at the back, I wouldn't have an issue with that. My issue that in that three, you've got Daniel Amati in there when you've got Chaglar Siunchu on the bench. Now, I don't know how badly Siunchu's done in training or what he's done to Brendan Rodgers to upset him so much, but there's no way you can you play a three in that game and he's not one of them and Daniel Amati is. It's just absolutely crazy. I think the injury to, to Barnes that he suffered in the previous game and Tete's lack of form meant that it wasn't a big shock really going 5-3-2. And I didn't mind it. I thought it was the right way to set up. What you've got is a complete lack of confidence from the players when they get anywhere over the halfway line at the minute and at the back. You know, we're so unconfident there as well that we look like an accident waiting to happen. So the fact we can see the three goals on Saturday, I'm not, not really surprised about. I think it's probably the right shape to go into Brentford with again next weekend, but with a couple of changes. Obviously, uh, Faz doesn't play at the weekend. Uh, he'll be suspended and then we have an international break. So, well, what team do you go into? Do you, do you stick to that formation we played at the weekend? You know, this is a Brentford team who have been flying in the league this season and for their only second season in the league, they've had a really good season once again. Do you, do you stick to this 3-5-2, oh, if we want to call it, so it's a bit more attackable? Do you go back to the 4-2-3-1 the and Johnny Evans drops in with Suter at the back? Tricky one. Um, almost feels a little bit like it doesn't matter what he does at the minute. It's just going wrong. Um, I think for me, I'd abandon it, if I'm honest. I'll go back to four at the back. Uh, Barnes, you would think, would be match fit by the time we get to the game at the weekend. Um, I guess you drop Tete back in on the right-hand side, although whilst I think he's trying hard, I don't think he's quite fathomed out the Premier League yet. Um, who did he play? Who does he play at the back, Tom? That's the question. I mean, with, with Faz out, does he drop Evans back in there, having not played any football in, in a long time, apart from those few minutes, obviously, at the weekend? Or does he play Armity at the back with Suter? Because I just can't see, as we've already alluded to, <coughs> him, him opting for C&Q. And, it, and, and, and I'm sorry, there can't be any football sense to that at all for me. There is no football sense in that decision at all. That is not a footballing decision. Um, it's got to be something else beyond that because it just makes no sense. Armity is struggling so much for any sort of form that, that yeah, if he, but yeah, I think he'll go back to four at the back. I absolutely do. I think he'll probably drop Evans in with Suter, uh, play the same full backs as, uh, as the weekend. And then we'll end up with Barnes and Tete playing wide back to one up front with Madison behind, I'd imagine. Obviously you've mentioned Tete. I was at Villa Park when he made his debut and we all thought we'd got a well beat on our hands, you know, to go, you know, got a nice goal and his assist. He looked an absolute well beater, taking Villa players on for fun, skipping past them. The Brazilian flair was there. What where's it gone wrong, Mark? Where, where, where's is he just suddenly hit a brick wall? Or has Brendan Rogers taken effect on him already in training yeah. sessions not to attack anymore, just go backwards? Because it seems a completely different player to what we saw at Villa Park, to the, what we saw against Tottenham, what we've seen at Man United, what we saw at the weekend, even at the weekend, he just lost looks lost to confidence yeah. suddenly. He's, he's not Brazilian, is he? Let's have it right. He's from <laughs> Bristol or something. So he's uh, he, he's struggling and he's struggling because he's too lightweight. He's not, he doesn't seem like he's quick enough on the ball. And I, I guess a classic Leicester thing to do would be to, to write the guy off after about six games. But five of these games, he's been absolutely rotten. And I thought he was again when he came on. Didn't do loads, but what he did do, he didn't do particularly well. And <coughs> like, against Villa, I thought, this is it. We've got our guy now that's going to replaced Mares. He was brimming with confidence. He was bringing the ball inside, hitting it on his left foot. He, he looked something else in that game. So whatever we've done, we, we've given him the Leicester City effect and maybe, dare I say, the Brendan Rodgers effect pretty, pretty quickly. Obviously, today, I think a couple of hours ago, we are just talking for came on air that, uh, that somehow it's been leaked that the players that we signed in January transfer windows has had clause in their contract that the club is relegated from the Premier League, that uh, they will have to take a percentage of a wage cut. Uh, obviously, the club probably don't want these things coming out into the press and the fans to find out because it doesn't set a good tone uh, for what's going on behind the scene. What do you feel when you see that, Simon? Does that not feel like the club's given up already or have a, a feeling that we could get relegated with Rogers in charge? If I'm honest, Tom, and obviously we were talking about this and I only found out about it just before we came on, but it doesn't surprise me in the situation. I mean, I suppose if you're a businessman looking at that, I guess you'd do it 
is it a bad message to the squad and the fans? Yes, absolutely it is. Um, uh, you know, why, why, why is Rogers still manager of Leicester City? Let's ask ourselves that question as well, because we've had junctions in the season where we could have made the switch. There were people around that I think the fans, including myself, and I'm sure you guys thought would probably be appropriate for that role to try and get us out of the situation we're in. We've slipped, slipped, slipped and slided along, hit and miss. You know, we, we're not moving on the pitch. The ball's going back to the defence all the time. We don't look confident. If you're running the club, are you trying to ensure yourself against the worst? Yes, you are. Is it the wrong message? Absolutely. But I, I, I can't help feeling at the minute we're just sleepwalking into a disaster. And it, I, I guess it, it just forms another part of that. What's your thoughts on it, Mark? You know, is it the same time or do you, do, you, do you feel it's just the club being sensible with the position the club's in at the moment in the league? Or do you generally feel that Top has seen enough that he still believes the club can start, but he's got to take a gamble and, you know, hope that the players accept they've got to take wage cuts if they go down, especially the new ones, because there's some big earners now in that squad still. Even if we release the likes of Tillemans, you know, of, and, and Madison leaves in the summer. I'll tell you where one of the biggest earners in the squad is that we can uh, that we can save some money from, and that's the manager, 120 odd grand a week or whatever he's on. Absolutely crazy. And for me, that you're absolutely right, Simon. That is the biggest point I've got at the minute. I, I don't have an issue with relegation clauses being in there. I think it makes perfect business sense to to put them in there. And I think any side in the bottom half of the table probably has them. Uh, it's just newsworthy because of where ourselves and. West Ham are at the minute, but I just cannot believe. And sleepwalking into relegation is exactly the right phrase because outside the club, I, I live in the West Midlands. I think you do as well, don't you? And you speak to the fans of Villa, Wolves around there, and everyone's like, "No, you'll be all right. Your team's good enough. You've got good players in the in the side. There's no way you'll go down." But they don't watch us week in, week out. They don't see the mentality that's running throughout the squad. And I look at that relegation zone at the minute, and I look at the sides in there that are dying for their shirts, they have absolutely given everything that they've got. Um, and I don't see that. And for me, that's, that comes from our manager. So I know we've skirted around the, the issue of the manager for a while. So thanks for bringing it up, Simon, because I'm so, so, so passionate about the fact now that his time is, it, it was done six months ago. It's definitely done now. And for me, the longer he's in position, the more complicit that the, the board are for keeping him, keeping him there because it's just an absolute nonsense. I can't see us winning another game this season. I, I mean, you talk, they talk about the manager and it's something we'll go on to quickly, but briefly, that different managers have different abilities depending where you are in the league for me. You've got the managers who are the steady eddies who will guarantee you a top 10 finish every year or mid-table finish, your Roy Hodgson's, your Sam Allardyce's at times. I know he's now the relegation bloke who keeps everyone up, but Sam Allardyce was a manager who kept West Ham, kept Everton in a steady position. You then got your elite managers, your Pep Guardiola's, Tan Hag, you know, these manager are elite to now know how to change a game when they're at the top of the league, but but probably would struggle if you put them at the bottom of the league in a relegation fight. I think Rogers is one of those managers who's all right when things are going well and you're in the mid mid table, top tip, top seven, but put him under the pressure he is now and he's starting to fold in my view and he's starting to give up. I think we saw that against Arsenal early in the season, the defeat, the, the the arrogance to blame everyone else but him. Do you think, Simon, that his mentality is not right to be a manager who's fighting a relegation battle? Uh, in a word, yes. Um, I look at the clubs around us. They look far more passionate, far more organised, far more determined to get out of the, out of the situation they're in than us at the minute. Um, there's a lot of comment in the media about, about his little clap on the side of the pitch as things are going on. You know, We can see the goal and there he is with his little clap. Like, come on, lads, come on, lads. But I don't think anyone's really paying any attention to it. Um, he seems to have had some really strange relationships with some of the players this season that I can't really understand. Um, you need everything, every piece of your toolkit you need when you're in a situation like this. And, and, and excluding players, because for whatever reason, we don't know, uh, but it's not football at times, it appears. It means it's utter nonsense to me when you're in this situation. I don't understand that. Um, tactics, as we've said before, are one-dimensional. We'll go out with a with a system and then we'll play it to death, uh, regardless of how the game's playing out quite a lot. We'll just keep playing the same football, much to the frustration of uh, of the fans that are sat around it. 
He takes players off at times, which I can't like the Mendy substitution on the on Saturday. Makes no sense whatsoever to anybody sat there. Can't understand what's going on. Uh, really, really odd. Um, he doesn't look like the, the the type of guy that's got the ingredients to get a job done for me. And whilst I've got absolute respect for some of the things we've done with Rogers in the past, it looks to me like like the situation is toxic. If I'm being honest. You uh, you mentioned the clap, and I was going to ask you both what you thought of this clap because obviously there's different type of managers. There's the managers like Conte who are bouncing around on the touchline, who are instructing their players constantly with hand movements and showing signs of passion and drive to get the teams forward. You've also got the, the manager who stand there very quietly and take it all in. And Rogers is obviously one of those who gets his little black pad out, writes down his shopping list and his takeaway order for the night ahead. How many booners he's going to have and bottles of wine when he gets back to his hotel and chill out after another loss in the De league. What do you think of this clap? Because it scrapes on me every game. I think Matty, Matty Piper even mentioned it on BBC Radio Leicester that the clap is starting to get on his nerves. What, what, I'll start with both of you boys. Mark, what do you think of the clap? Because it's grated on me a lot now. It doesn't get on my nerves as much as the fact that he's still in that dugout and technical area to do it. That's that's what I would say first and foremost. Do you know what I would say about Rogers as well? You talk about people that are wanting to, you know, fight for everything while they're down there. I think if you offered him half of his payout at the minute to leave uh, and leave now, he would take it. And is that the sort of guy you want leaving you into battle? Not for me. You know, people say the the question is is always, isn't it? Who would you get? Who was the person that you'd replace him with? That's the defence of people that still want Rodgers to be at the club. My question to them would be, who who wouldn't be better at this moment in time? Who wouldn't give us that bounce or that extra little bit of oomph to go out and, and start to toughen up a little bit? Because we're so soft. But back to his clap, I don't really care about it, if I'm honest. It just it doesn't bother me. <laughs> Simon, what do you think of the clap? Um, I, I respect it's getting on your wick, Tommy. I, I, at times, especially when we concede a goal and he starts to uh, he starts to get it out, it does wind me up as well. Um, I think it just alludes to the kind of passive nature of the club at the minute. You know, everything feels a bit passive. We're not pressing teams. We're not passionate at trying to get the ball back. We're not fighting in the tackle. We don't look confident. The players aren't really talking to each other much. They're not trying to motivate each other. And then you've got Rogers on the side with his little clap as we go along. And the whole thing just looks like it's passively sliding into relegation. Now, with all the with all of the, the plans at the club for the expansion of the stadium and, and all the rest of it, <coughs> the one thing that club can't do, and especially added to a £93 million loss in the, last, uh, in the last accounts, the one thing that club can't afford to do right now is get relegated. Yet it seems to be, as we've all alluded to tonight, sleepwalking into exactly that. And no one seems to be doing anything proactive about stopping it. And it's frightening. And it's, it's massively frustrating for us as fans sat there having to experience it week in, week out. Now, boys, we've heard some chants in the times at the club. You know, obviously, we heard the one Rogers out. We, we want Rogers out. I'd never heard set fans singing, Brendan, or singing about a manager taking us down. I don't think yeah. I've ever heard a, a, the, the chant, a manager is taking you down. And I don't get how Rogers can stand there and just go, I don't really care what the fans are saying in my view. Yeah, I respect them, but. It's not my problem. I ain't going to listen to them. He doesn't respect them. He doesn't respect them. You know, it's, it's, it's there, you know, he came out on Saturday and said, I oh, respect the fans. You know, they're allowed their say. But it's the arrogance. They're singing they, what they think you're taking us down and you're standing there going, oh, well. You know, it's not, like you said, there's no battle. There's no passion. And if you look at people say about who could you got, you look at Sean Dyche. He's got the Everton out the relegation zone. Yes, they've only won a couple of games, but that just shows you how tight it is at the bottom. But you also see him on the touchline when things aren't going well. He's the first to shout at the players. He isn't scared to rip into the players on the touchline when they've done something wrong and get them to do it right. And I think at the moment, that's the kind of person you need in. You need someone on that touchline to absolutely pull them apart. When someone loses the ball, not just stand there and look at it and then just turn away. Rip into them. Let them know they've made a mistake there that could have cost us a goal. I mean, now we go into the... the the final stage, I mean, for me, boys, I don't know what you thought, but this game of the weekend goes into the must-win category now because if we were to go into that international break at the weekend, uh, Mark, with another defeat, that's six defeats in the row in League and Cup. How, mm. how does Brendan go into that international break with a group of players, some that will go away on international football, some will be stuck around the training ground for the next two weeks until we play again? How, how does he really turn this team around if it, he's still here? Because... I generally don't see how the board are going to sack him now. I'm honest about it. I want him gone. 
but the, the, they've had plenty of opportunities in the last two, three weeks after the poor performance to do it, and they still haven't. How does Brendan Rodgers turn this around then, Mark, keep going forward? Listen, I'm going to come across as negative when I say this, but he, he doesn't turn it around. There, there is no way, I don't think it's possible. I think you can get odds at the minute of 30 to 1 to Leicester to finish bottom of the Premier League this season. I'd suggest that's a good investment for all of us to get onto uh, because the, the, I, I, I can't see him motivating the players. I can't see a freshness that, that we would need. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not a massive one for sacking managers. I'm probably one of the later ones to this situation, but we, we have to make a change. And I don't know if you agree with me or not what I said earlier about the board, but, you know, Topper's got to look at himself and think he's allowing this now. And, and you're almost going to the conversation of would his dad have allowed this and I know that's a horrible comparison to make but you, you know I don't think he I don't think he would have stood for this he would have is it he was an astute businessman who would realize that his investment is going to be worth much much less in the championship next season and I've seen in the comments people talk about how if you go down there's no guarantee that you're coming back up and we need a, a whole rebuild of our playing squad we almost need a whole rebuild of the mentality and um, but I think the best we can hope for is getting rid of the, of the next opportunity and bringing someone in. I don't see it happening, though. I, I can't see a situation where Brendan Rodgers isn't in charge of this football club this season. Final question to you both then, boys. Start with you, Simon. What's the result going to be at Brentford on Saturday? Oh, dear, Tom. What a question that's going to be tonight. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I, if we get a point at Brentford, I'll be delighted uh, the way we're playing at the minute. And, and I'll, 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 I mean, we're not going to keep a clean sheet. Let's face it, chaps. That's not going to happen. So I'll go with two-two, and I'll, I'll be positive that we'll stop the stop the rot with a draw, score draw away at Brentford on on the weekend. Thanks for joining us, Simon. Cheers, mate. Thank you, mate. Appreciate it. Take care. Mark, final question goes to you again, mate. What do you think the result's going to be at the weekend, bud? Well, everything about it tells me that we're going to lose, but I'm going to go for a 2-1 Leicester win because I just live in hope. That's <laughs> the only place that that comes from. I can see it and Buemo and uh, Tony causing us big problems and they're, they're quite sound defensively, aren't they? So it's going to be a really, really tough game to go there. Uh, but in, in my in my blue-tinted blue, blue tinted specs and my uh, in, in my heart, I still think you know we can go and win. I don't, I don't know where that comes from. It's just the hope, I think, and it's the hope that kills you, isn't it? Exactly, mate. Mark, as always, thank you for joining us. Obviously, if people don't follow you. Go and follow Mark on the It's Eleven, It's Heaven, It's Jamie Vardy podcast. It's a cracking show. They've got a Villa fan on for some reason. They put up with him, I think. I think yeah, he's still exactly sorry for him at best of times. Thanks as always, Mark. Cheers, mate. No worries. And there we go. Another fan show on a Monday night. Obviously, Phil's, Phil was having a nice quiet night in. Bottle of wine, taking it easy. As always, guys, thank you for joining tonight. Thank you for so many comments. It's been a cracking night. Lots to talk about. Obviously, we're all bitterly disappointed with what's going on at the football club. As I said last time, we've still got to get behind the players. We've still got to get behind, you know, the team going into the last 10 games, whatever it is left of the season. If you don't like Brendan, like I don't, as I said Saturday, I didn't back Brendan. I backed the boys and I was made enough noise in the ground with my son to get behind the team, even though it's struggling. Got to back the team until the end of the season. I hope we can turn some form around. But for now, thank you for joining me and good night. Thanks for watching Leicester Fan TV. Thanks to our sponsors, ADT Taxis, Everards, Pucka Pies, Pink Car Leasing, Lester Riders, Hologram, The Fox's Arms, Peter's Pizzeria, Hope Against Cancer, and Newbie and Co Estate Agents. Make sure to follow us on all of our social channels at Lester Fan TV. Visit our website, LesterFanTV.com.